You're listening to Atoms, Motion, and the Void. Night Stories, a wonderful program of stories and music that rivals the moon in radiance. Chapter 5, How Fortinbras Met Gruel McGee. As I departed the cave and began to make my way to Glister Hall, I did so fully aware of Mrs. Lady's request or order from the prior night's reverie on the island of Trash. Convinced as she was that the great pink stone sea wall in our shared dream bore more than a passing resemblance to the wall surrounding Glister Hall, Mrs. Lady leapt to a certainty that the hall's proprietor, Goodwin Sand, must therefore have some knowledge of where on the island her missing arms and legs might be. And for a short time, my goal for the day was simply to make a due diligence attempt to meet up with the apparently unmeetable Goodwin Sand, after which failure it was my expectation that I would then have free reign to make use of Mrs. Lady's chickens. But yet, of course, I found this mission departing in the effervescent way dreams do. It was there, and then went ghostly, and then was gone. And soon enough I found myself in a field with no recollection whatsoever of the dream or the chore, or what in fact I was doing. At any rate, I stood suchly, and suchly stood with me in a weedy field between forests. I grasped for a time after the ghost of the dream and then sought to find the source of my current whereabouts and where to fall. Why had I so eagerly departed the cave? Heading where? Eagerly? Why? A stand-in sort of answer stepped forward. Wasn't I at that very moment off to the great viewing? For hadn't I heard that Goodwin Sand, or Fortinbras, as I called him, of Glister Hall, was finally, today, drawing down his wall-sheets? "'Come stand with us and see his castle,' someone said. "'Come play detective and help us solve the mystery of the missing brother.' I took a sturdy breath here to re-establish this as my true purpose, and began my descent over the smaller hill before me. A note on terminology. I only call a hill a hill if it's barren of all achievement save for grass and weed. A hill-sized hill with trees pinned atop is a knoll to me. A hill with rocky outcroppings is a bluff to me. In the same way a thin river is a stream and a brackish one a brook. A huge lake with lily pads is a pond and a small pond without lily pads is a lake, unless it has frogs. Anything with frogs, even the ocean, is a pond to me. A lake so vast that I cannot see the far side is a sea. So for me, a hill must be the earth and equivalent of a bald man's head. This is how I make my way through the world. Amen. Let's pause to clear our minds. Never mind, it's harder than filling up rooms. It's hard. To clear our minds Clearly it's something we'd rather not do Here's another note On terminology It helps to do hard things With bells from your toaster Here's another note On terminology It helps to do hard things One foot on the ground, one in the sky, let's pause to clear our minds. Ding. A note on Fortinbras's name. I call him Fortinbras, and while it's possible that I am remembering rightly some bit of something from long ago, more likely, I whipped the name up in the thin air formed by my diet of very old novels, deep slumber, and long walks to nowhere. His real name may well be Goodwin Sand, 
as Mrs. Lady referred to him, but to me he is Fortinbras. To the local children he is known as Dainty Marblehead, and is called Pasha by the more romantic, elderly, and single women in town. To the roving squad of lemon bird watchers he has been christened Gerald Fielder, for they have spied him in his garden pulling weeds on hands and knees. For it is that Fortinbras, or Pasha, or Dainty Marblehead, or Gerald Fielder, or Goodwin Sand, is one of those stubbornly ungraspable types who forever attract fresh nomination. All who spot him or hear of him seem to name him for want of getting to understand him better. Much of what attracts us to him, of course, is his retreat from us. This has long been the way of the world. He does not wish us to see him, to know of him, and therefore these are the only things we strive after. Of the origins of the pet name Pasha, there is the story, told by the romantic elderly single ladies earlier mentioned, that if one stands just outside the castle's western walls and steps up the low branches of a certain oak tree, Pasha can be seen roving about his roof, going back and forth with a candle, head tipped skyward as he regards the cosmos, even when there are clouds, even when it is raining, and wherewith, to them thrillingly, despite the rain and because of it, Pasha must relight his candle dozens of times, which candle work they find exquisitely heartrending. In addition, so they say, from the same place in the branches, Pasha can sometimes be seen walking in the forest, reading an astoundingly mighty book, walking forward and then actually backward from one tree to another. Not only do they marvel that he can be so concentrated on whatever tale it is as he moves backwardsly through the rough woods, but that he can hold the mighty tome, and that is what they call it, the mighty tome, in one hand, with such ease. I mention this as the name Pasha derives, so I imagine, from these two observed conditions, stargazing with a candle in the rain and reading the mighty tome while walking backwards in the woods. This apparently earns you the name Pasha in the hearts of a half a dozen ladies nearing their 80th year, who will step onto branches near walls in the rain at night and fall in love with a man who must stare at stars and have his candle lit no matter what. As to the dainty Marblehead nickname, the story goes like this, as reported to me by 14-year-old Jane Cross, who said that she and her friends once scaled Fortinbras's castle wall to see what they could see. Scattered everywhere about the land, just outside his great stone wall, Jane said, are countless, bewildering, because conflicting, signs hung from tree branches by thick wire. Some say keep out, and some say come right in. The keep out signs bear frightening images of fire-breathing dragons, or the welcoming signs are inscribed with childlike drawings of happy clouds and smiling puppies, so Jane says. It was near one of the more inviting signs that Jane and her friends set up a ladder and scaled Fortinbras's wall. They sat for a time on the wall itself, as none of them wished quite yet to make the ten-foot jump down, but a splashing sound somewhere on the castle grounds soon proved too alluring for three teenage girls to ignore. So they leapt into the air and crashed down to the earth, each of them spraining an ankle or twisting a wrist in the jump, which injuries lent a tang of battle to the experience. And so the three tattered friends, arm in arm, soon to be the wounded veterans of a fantastic memory, hobbled together through Fortinbras's forest and onward into his horse barn, as they were suddenly keen to be near horses, although there was not a horse to be found, until they soon found themselves crawling through a fern garden, where they finally beheld the source of the splashing. It was Fortinbras himself, old, thin, bald, paper-white Fortinbras himself, in a handkerchief bathing suit or elderly diaper, standing at the back end of a diving board, hands clasped together 
in devotional prayer. He clicked open his eyes, Jane reported, took three elegant but silly steps, swinging his arms like a make-believe gymnast, and then, now pretending to be a ballet dancer, pointed his toes as he jumped once over the board, and then, with such earnest boldness, performed what he intended to be a majestic swan dive into what was a coal-black fish pond. This dive proved an irresistibly slow affair, as though Fort and Brass were falling not through the air, but through an invisible water above the water, all of which oddness built them to bursting, and the girls could not help but laugh at the strangeness, and so loudly they feared Fort and Brass might hear them, but he did not, which set an eerie pause upon them. Was the man deaf, they wondered. They continued to watch him rise again up the ladder, click open his eyes, once more clasp his hands in prayer, and take his gallivanting steps along the board, and dive in his diaper with great bold earnestness through the thickened air, down, 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 into the black lagoon. Jane suggested here that Fortinbras, as he strode his circuit from pond edge to diving board, walked as though he were escorting himself, something she could not further explain or fathom, only that there was an unsettling quality to the whole event, a disturbing offness due the clockwork replication, the exact sameness of each clicking of the eyes and majestically meant swan dive and subsequent self-escorting steps. And was there not an unnatural daintiness to all his movement, they wondered, and was it not strange that he had not overheard them when they laughed? And did it not seem as though somehow he were carrying himself, or was being held aloft, or was weightless, or not quite touching the earth throughout? Over and over again, in perfect replication, did Fortinbras dive. At some point, as he made his way up the diving board ladder, despite their growing trepidation, Jane suggested that they should rate Dainty Marblehead on his diving performance. The girls examined one another from the perfection of such a name and fell into a beautiful silence and soon withdrew from the ferns. For they each realized that this was why they had come. This was the precise and only purpose of their visit, to name him to bestow upon the deaf, diaper-wearing, bold-diving mystery a name which spoke his mystery. It is a magic in itself to name something or someone, a skill as no other, and I should think there are artists in this world whose talent lies only there, in the rabbit-from-a-hat-right naming of objects and persons. A name is a primitive, is a sound and a scent and a nature and a rhythm and a secret. It is both the box around a thing, and it is exactly not the box around a thing, but it is from that box that a thing will forever attempt escape, which it cannot, because it is not in it. But it is just this very strain of a thing as it tries to escape from the thing it is not trapped within that allows for a name to be divined. Nearly lastly, and disconnectedly, and as a side note as we parted, I asked Jane if she and her friends had any nickname for me. Her smile fell away, and at first she refused to say, but I pushed her and told her I would laugh at whatever name it was and never complain and never look at her darkly. She eventually wrote my nickname down on a piece of paper which I had to vow not to read until she was gone, and in fact I put the note in my pocket and only before bed that night did I open it up. Your name, Jane had written, is Gruel McGee. And Gruel McGee did laugh as hard as any girl watching a bold man in a diaper divulge his true name by means of a well-meant dive. As I drifted off to sleep that night, I attempted to recall all the different soups I must have spilt down my shirt front 
Till they tell us not to stare If we see you anywhere And if we laugh, well then it's true And it certainly might possibly be cruel Just like a street goes everywhere Well, I wonder, is it possible to care? And in the fragrance of that fuel, you see, I'm afraid we call you Gruel McGee. Your name is Gruel McGee. Hallelujah, Signorina. They took my old damn name. I slipped into a major vena. How can anyone maintain a conscience and a presence and a everything that can sustain a man, a oh woman, a oh child? People like to call Glister Hall a castle because it is so unlike any of our little loaf of bread homes and because it is made of stone and is quite large and because, I suppose, it has a name. There are also a number of flags, or flagpoles, at least, atop the roof, which roof is flat and rovable. There are no other homes with roofs in lemon whereupon one can trot about and recreate as Pasha does stargazing with a candle. Still, though, Glister Hall has no turrets or moats and is more in keeping with my idea of a manor house, the sort of second smaller hobby house of someone with a castle elsewhere. I don't mean to say that I call Glister Hall a manor house. No, I am the first in line to call it a castle. And this is all to say that you should not exactly picture a castle, or if you do, remember that it is not while still recollecting that it might be finer to call it such. Of Fortin Brass and Glister Hall, I know only the regular number of circulated stories, some already mentioned, some likely, some not. It is said Fortin Brass is, or was, an artist with a capital A. That is how it is said, artist with a capital A, and little else has ever ventured. Some have said Fortin Brass wrote a single book, long, long ago, that this book was turned into a film, that he made his fortune from one or both of these. But other rumours suggest that he may have been a fine painter or exquisite poet or modern composer. So, in fact, none of us really has a clue what he was or whether he was. And in a way, it is as though everyone in town is the proud keeper of Fortinbras's particular secret, a secret they themselves do not actually know. It is also said that the lone butler at Glister Hall is in fact Fortinbras's own brother, whom, I should say, we refer to in town exclusively as Butler, and who, following an opposite trajectory, is said to have fallen on hard times as a young man, into a hazy poverty and obscurity, just as Fortinbras took his art from lower case to upper. Upon the Glister Hall property, there is a ruined hut that helps tell Butler's story, for it is said that Butler lived in the shack alone for many, many years, as a non-Butler, and in ruin, and in what was then a wilderness, until Fortinbras arrived, and who, therewith, Fortinbras, I mean, having made his fortune as an artist and done his turn in the world, decided to build a great castle and protective bailey, or wall, to surround himself and his fallen brother, and his brother's little shack. Whether to hide his brother from family embarrassment, or to save his brother from sad, sad indigence, or simply to trap himself a butler, none of this has ever been clear. It is said that the brothers have a similar look, though butler is said to be less erect, more depleted, a haggard version 
of the success. It is also supposed, though as far as I can tell without any reason whatsoever, that something must certainly have happened to one of them. What is said in town is this. No one seen the pair of them together in quite a long time, or possibly ever. Only one lone figure is ever seen, stargazing on the roof, reading between the trees, gardening, diving, with the shadowy lump and presumed figure of butler, sometimes noted in the crumbling shack, where he apparently, and stubbornly, or perforce, continues to reside, if his heart still beats. And here is where the story grabs me most, and why, presently, I supposed I was heading to Glister Hall, for the worst of the gossip suggests that one of the brothers perished, but which one? No one could exactly say. If it was Fortinbras, the gossip inclined, was it not probable and favourable that Butler should take advantage of the moment and slide himself into the better brother's position, become the lead man, the monarch of Glister Hall? For why shouldn't the pauper become the prince if there's no price to pay? And which of the paupers amongst us would not agree to such a painlessly fine upgrade? On the other, less exciting, though honestly no different side, if Butler had died, had Fortinbras simply buried him on the grounds without alerting any authority. Adding to this, or straggling off it, is the mentioned report that a very still, dead-like man can be seen from a particular tree, slumped in a chair in the shack. Was Butler to be buried in his own rickety chair? The gossips wondered. And could we tolerate this violation of human instinct to have a man in town who not only enslaved his own brother as a butler, but then had the audacity to let him be dead in such a way as this, dead in a nearby chair without a single civilized ritual engaged? So, yes, there was the cold crown feeling of murder when the details were strung out in this way and a sense that if it were true that Wartenbrass had done exactly nothing upon the death of Butler, that he should likely be shifted from stargazing at the top of his castle to wall-hanging at the bottom, to the dungeon, it was suggested, if Wartenbrass of Glister Hall had one. Somewhat sadly, this same reason and logic did not entail in the reverse. If Wartenbrass died, no one wondered of the crime of Butler leaving him to rot in his palace. They only considered the windfall by proxy. One story was cheered, one jeered. And this might be a difference between rich and poor, or this might simply speak to the fragility and splendor of the human mind, that it prefers to see what is essentially the same thing from vastly different vantages when it's pleasant and agreeable to do so. When our frogs change, they become princes. When our princes change, they become frogs. From a single magic kiss, one takes flight in miracle, while the other is welcomed to ignominy. I need something easy to sing, and a song I can sing all the time. I don't need words or to know all the notes, but I'd like it if everything rhymed.
Have you ever looked up to the sun? Feel like you've been paid. Have you ever filled up someone and then walked away? Well, I ain't been living that way my whole life for free. No, I ain't been living that way. Towns, elation to see how Jane runs. The towns celebration runs. Something easy to sing and a song I can sing all the time. I don't need words or to know all the notes, but I'd like it if everything rhymed. I should say something about the Great War. There is nothing that creates so much appetite for trespass. As does a magnificent wall, made of a toppled pinkish stone. The Great Wall is ten feet high, ten feet wide, and four miles long, and very nearly encloses Fortinbras's thousand-acre property. One of the very earliest things I ever heard about Fortinbras was that he sometimes drove his 1957 Studebaker along the roadway of his wall. A rare and disbelieved rumor. But there are those who insist that they have seen a car rattling along over the wall as though it were a cobbled country lane. While there are none that doubt the scientific possibility, for the wall is wide enough to handle a car, dispute arises due to the fact that the wall is incomplete and unfinished. There is a small gap in the wall that spans some twenty feet, and so if Fortinbras did take his Studebaker out for drives upon the wall, well then. Would he not, at some point, come to the end point, and having no room to turn the car around, would he not then have to travel in reverse the entire way back? An intolerable situation, unless, as it was suggested, and then held against him, Fortinbras did the fun drive out and left the miserable reversing to Butler. Of this break in the wall, not much is certain. Whether Fortinbras ran out of funds or found himself in dispute with the wall maker is not known. Regardless, there is this mentioned gap of some twenty feet where the north-going wall fails to meet the south-going. In place of stone and spanning the unfinished section, then is a bit of makeshift in the form of a system of sheets. A wall of cotton bed sheets hitched top and bottom is the lone connection between the unjoined walls. And because these fabric walls are white linen, they grow hideous in the air and must be unpinned from their style posts and sent to the cleaners. And when this happens, when the dish rag walls are removed, word climbs quickly through town, and every last villager will drop everything, and I mean everything, and gather at the vacant spot in the now unsheeted section of Fortinbras's wall to see. What can be seen, to spot a crime, perhaps, to raise a hue and cry, to point their fingers and at last call out, "Murderer!" is the hope. It seems to me, and I mean to say, binoculars are brought and telescopes are set up and there are snack stands and so on, and all in town gaze upon the castle to see whatever might be seen, to learn whatever might be learned of Fortinbras and Butler.
while calling out clues and suppositions as to the whatever in the world it is that might be going on there. And so I came down one hill and the next, getting closer, so I supposed, though not exactly sure where I was, in fact. As I am rather geographically hopeful, I have an inclination to do things in the spirit of exploration, and on my own account, without much referencing to maps or people. These tendencies conspire to leave me often in the wrong places, at what I fondly wish might be the right times. More often than not, however, I find myself stranded for intolerable stretches in parts unknown with very little to do, in a state that most would call lost. Thus, as I came from a thick wood at the bottom of the bald hill into a thinner, more painterly forest, I found myself suddenly face to face with the pink stones of the very wall itself, with no real idea which direction might provide the quickest route to the impromptu picnic grounds and accusatory chatterfest of telescopes and clue calling and barbecue grilling that I felt sure must have already established at the section where the bedsheets had been brought down. If I were a younger man, no doubt it would occur to me that I should instantly climb this wall, which, because it reaches well above one's view, and I suppose because of the odd pink color of the stone, brings on an inordinate curiosity. What, one burningly wonders, is on the other side of this pinkly fun and engaging and knobby wall? And as burning wonder tends to override one's recollected sense of self, I found myself placing my fingertips into a crevice at about shoulder height. I set a foot into a dark spot in the wall and began to climb, and only upon this first pairing of manoeuvres did I recall what I had so recently recalled, that my scaling years were long behind me, that I was not a young man, and that, of course, the deed should prove undoable for one such as I. No seventy-nine-year-old man can climb a ten-foot wall, I told myself, even as I undertook to do it. And as I did, a little film strip began to play, a newsreel which devoted itself to my achievement, and I watched how, in darkened cinemas the world over, it came to be known that Gruel McGee, formerly show and sleeves, had reset the limits as far as old people and walls, that I would, if I could make it to the top of this wall, open a door to an unexplored new land for the nearly dead. Well, if Gruel McGee can do it, one old lady called out from the vertiginous shear of the Matterhorn in the film strip I was watching. We realized we might as well, too. The newsreel ended, and I found myself exhausted and halfway up the wall. Where one difficulty was strength, or lack thereof, the more principal challenge was simply to find the right bits to craft my ascendance, places that were higher than I was, where I could stick a finger, and then the subsequent shadowy places to lodge a foot. Were you to see my wondrous climb, you would as likely suppose me on my way down. Such were the long spells of zero or negative achievement, of motionlessness and or troublesome side-scalings required to find the right network of holes and bumps to get myself so slightly higher. In fact, a very long period ensued when I found myself, inadvertently, through simple complicated negotiation, making my way down the wall in order to continue up it. But yet eventually I found myself nearing the crest. At the top of any wall or fence, or cliff even, perhaps, for that matter, there is a delicate transition which must be undertook, between the climbing up and the being on, a kind of leg-overing, chest-punching, knee-undering maneuver, which I realized, as I arrived at this penultimate stage, was quite the most difficult part of getting to the top of a nearly climbed thing. And so there arose the new and timeless circumstance of my being lodged, as it were, mid-somersault, with one hand grappling the top stones and one leg thrust over the wall top, while the rest of my person agreeably heaved toward the concept of being on top while remaining mostly stuck on the side, all this while being absolutely dead to any further activity. Instead of falling to the bottom of a hole with no chance of getting up, here I had in some way fallen to the top of a wall 
with no way of getting on. I repeatedly set a stock of energy into oomphing myself up and over that vertus of wall and said things like, Now, now, here we go. And then I put a bit of suggestion into prying my leg off the upper level to return it back to safety. But bottom line, I had become as a kind of rubber band stretched between three nubby points. From here, at least, it occurred to me I could survey his grounds. I expected upon glancing upward, cheek to stone, that I'd be handed an elegant postcard from Scotland in terms of the delivered vista. Green would be the running fields of grass. Grey would be the mighty stone of the house. White pebbles in the driveway, gardens dotted red and purple. Fortinbras himself, perhaps, standing captain-like in a tricorn hat and tweed coat, with blousy pants tucked into yellow knee socks, which bore the family crest above a pair of glistening caramel-coloured shoes. Possibly he would be humming, but I saw no signs of Scotland, nor Fortinbras, nor Glister Hall. But instead, on the far side of the wall, lay more of the painterly forest, and not twenty yards off from my perch, the weather-bombed roof of Butler's shack. I called out once or twice in a whisper yell, Butler! And then, Fortinbras! And then softer, because silly, Pasha! And then barely making any sound, Dainty Marblehead! Is anyone there? I strained for the shack, listening for some reply, and heard the faintest chitter, a soft shifting rattle in the distance, a kind of pitching and rhythmic whining, is what it seemed to me. A moment later I saw, perhaps a quarter mile off, and actually on the wall itself, and coming my way, a black and tawny roadster, Fortinbras's 1957 Studebaker, a pleasingly chilling fairy tale image, as beyond the absurdity of an antique car wending its way along a wall, there was the unfortunate fact that I was a bit too much on the wall, and likely in harm's way. I thusly renewed my appeals to youth and safety both, to get myself either up upon the wall and then off it, or to simply withdraw my limbs from the thoroughfare that they not be run down. The car approached and approached, rumbling now, its tires making a rough slap and caromsome grind against the wavy wall top, and I kept my eyes on it to see about the matching of the widths. For while the road upon the wall was a bit wider than the width of the Studebaker's wheels, it would have been a very fine miss indeed if some bit of something automotive failed to strike some bit of something me. It was then that I heard a kind of second lower sound, a pounding of the earth together with a moaning huffage, and this now I could see was the noise of a galloping crowd. In fact, the villagers, who might suppose that the community get-together at the wall opening, were now all racing along, higgledy-piggledy, chasing after the Studebaker above them. And who would you imagine led this riotous charge? It was young Jane Cross herself, racing out at the front of the pack. It was here that I recalled that she had told me about this running of the wall, that it was a regular feature of the festival, and that she herself had won the right to be the so-called war queen, the pack leader of this ritual. As the car rushed past in a metal wind and gust of brown engine blast, I felt the pressure of several sturdy impacts as the two nearest wheels ran directly and twice over my right hand, leaving it fish-dead and numb, and then as well each tire burn struck my right knee for a total of four impacts. Yet what proved worse than these injuries, what was simply barbaric and soured me for some time on the human animal, involved the unbelievable action of the motley villagers chasing after the car, for they had the hellish instinct to grope at me as they ran along. Indeed, it was this variety of grabbings and scrapings as one after the next renegade car chaser either took hold of my bottommost left shoe and gave it a firm tug, or chose to use their fingernails to design a unique scratch upon my exposed ankle. 
One can only be shocked in spirit by a single event. If you fall from an airplane without a parachute, and someone else falling throws a cake at you, well, you might find yourself wondering about the dreadful cake part of the experience exclusively before recalling the tragedy of the fall itself. Thus, my fish-numb hand and freshly tired knee meant nothing to me. Why? I called out to the departing renegades. Why? In what universe do we grab at the old man, stuck on the wall, and pluck off his shoe, and scratch his ankles with our farmer fingers? A man we have clearly just seen somewhat run over by a Studebaker, a man who is achieving something remarkable and life-altering in terms of getting up walls for all persons of superior age. The plain and sombre old car went off, and the wild, nonsensical parade with it. My upper half had been carved, my lower half personed, and as I turned to look down, hoping to find my shoe, and perhaps transport it back onto my foot, using the long dormant telekinetic power I continued to believe lurked within me, I saw a lone figure standing quietly below, a tall man, barefoot, wearing a kind of white bathing towel, or diaper, with a great bold skull of a pale head. Well, Fortinbras said, as he slipped his naked foot into my lone left shoe, if it isn't Gruel McGee. been listening to Atoms, Motion, and the Void. For more information on the show, please visit my website at radioghost.com. And if you wish to follow me in person, you may find me on Market Mountain in Lemon, New Hampshire, or on the Trash Island in the Mysterious Dream. If you wish to follow me in the mysterious world we live in, you may find me on Twitter and Facebook at Show and Sleeves. Feel free or unfree, as your way attends, to write me at showandsleeves at yahoo.com or simply call out into the void itself, for I am always listening. Thank you, my friends, and remember, always merry and bright. <laughs>